Hi, welcome to Conversations with me, Karen Van Horen, a fashion historian and curator. My guests today are April Callahan and Cassidy Zachary, co-hosts of the fashion history podcast, Dressed. In our conversations, they told me how they started to collaborate and why they chose the medium of a podcast to share their knowledge of fashion history. They also shared with me some of their favorite moments from over 200 episodes they've recorded so far. Hi, April and Cassidy. Welcome. Hello. Hello. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much for being here and making the time. Why don't you introduce yourself and uh, tell me who you are and what you do. Cass, you can go first. Okay, my name is Cassidy Zachary. I am a fashion historian, a co-host and co-creator of the Dressed podcast with April Callahan. And I also am a full-time PhD student at the University of New Mexico here in New Mexico. Um, and I'm April Callahan and also likewise fashion historian um, and co-host and uh, producer of Dress with Cass. And then in my other life, um, I'm a curator in special collections at um, the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York. Yeah, so before I, I ask you about how you even juggle all of those things, um, I wanted to ask you how you started to even collaborate. How that, did that come together? Ah, that's a good story. Can I, t can I do this one, Cass? Yeah, go for it. Okay, so uh, Cassidy and I actually met um, in FIT Special Collections. Uh, she was in grad school at the time, finishing her master's degree in the Fashion and Textile Studies program. And I was actually there um, working on my first book, which was on the history of fashion plates. So um, all of the primary sources I was using for the book were from special collections. So I was spending a ton of time there. And Cass happened to be doing an internship. And then we met and then we just kind of hit it off. And then at the tail end of the kind of like working on the book, I realized that I needed like some help, some research help, because I had to like fact check all the titles of all the magazines for each individual plate, because a lot of the magazines were like merging with each other and changing their titles. Like from six months to another six months, the title may be completely different, but it was still kind of the same magazine. So anyway, um, Cass came on board um, and, and helped with all of that, like really like detailed, like minutia, looking up everything. Um, and then we just realized that we work together so well, and we also have very similar writing styles. So we decided, well, now that that book is done, let's write a book together. So that's how we started working together. And, yeah, that, and I'd actually, like what? I was interning at Special Collections, yeah. yeah. And had done a bibliography on Schwar, which is a hand stenciling technique. And um, when Thames and Hudson came kind of looking for book titles, uh, April and I just decided to collaborate. It was a perfect fit. Yes. And that was like seven years ago now, something like yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to believe how quickly time passes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so then you started, you wrote a book together. Um, yeah. Tell me a little bit about that project, which is incredible, by the way. Yeah, so Fashion the Art of Pochoir, like I said, I was interning at Special Collections my second year at FIT, and they had this incredibly extensive collection on Pochoir, which is this French hand stenciling technique. And there was really this golden age of fashion illustration from about 1908 to 1925, in which these haute luxury fashion publications produced these hand stenciled plates. And FIT has this like incredible collection, all of these incredibly rare titles. And so I did a bibli um, a bibliography. I did, um, I did a, um, you know, kind of like a survey of their collection. And it just, it's, it's so incredibly beautiful. As you see here, uh, George Barbier is one of kind of the premier illustrators that worked in this medium. And so once April and I got the book contract, we just, you know, set out to research and learn as much about this method as we could. And then the really fun and equally hard part was going through FIT's hundreds and hundreds of 
fashion plates and trying to pick which ones to put in the book. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was, it was like Sophie's choice. There were some of them that um, were like, were definitely our favorites, but we just couldn't put them in for one reason or another. And um, one of those big deciding factors had a lot to do with copyright too. So mm -hmm. anyone out there is considering writing a book, um, copyright, copyright, copyright. Think that through before you like sign sign the book contract. That would be yeah. my <laughs> that, that alone is a year of work. Uh. <laughs> And the other thing, too, I should say is that I was in New Mexico at this time and April was in New York while we were writing this book together. And that kind of segues into collaborating on the podcast only because we knew that we could work remotely from each other and still collaborate. Um, we are and actually work so where, very well separately. <laughs> and so where did that idea to to do a podcast about something that's so visual? Um, why a podcast? Ah, well... So kind of how that all came about, that's an interesting story. Um, after the Push Bar book came out, which was in 2015, Cass and I were like, we want to keep working together. We want to do something else, but we don't want to do another book. We, we, were, we knew it, it needed to be a different format. So we had been actually discussing doing a project. We weren't exactly sure what form or shape it was going to take, but we knew it was going to be called Dress the History of Fashion. Um, and what happened was is that first book that where Cass and I first met, the Fashion Plates book, um, the publisher sent a, a press copy of it to Holly Fry, who is the co-host and producer of Stuff You Missed in History Class, um, which is like, that show has been around eight or nine years. It's like really popular all over the world. Um, and she sent me an email and said, hey, would you come and be on our podcast as a guest um, and to discuss your book? So I said, sure, I'd love to. And then I did. And then a few months later, they had me back a second time to talk about a different fashion history related topic. Um, and then cut forward a little bit moving forward. How Stuff Works um, was the was the parent company at that time. They actually came to me and said, "Would you like to develop your own show?" And then so I called Cass and I'm like, "Want to make a podcast?" <laughs> <laughs> you know, because when somebody when somebody of that you know caliber of a company comes to you and and says like, "Do you want to do this?" You you say yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you do not say no. Do not look to get Taurus in the mouth. So, yeah. And I mean, in terms of it being a ver very visual medium, it was always really important to us to use Instagram. We knew that Instagram was going to be really central to the podcast. Mm -hmm. And um, so we take a lot of care with producing images that accompany each week's podcast. That's a really big part of what we do because it is such a visually driven uh, medium. Yeah. I think... And uh, it's a joke. It's a joke around um, how stuff works on iHeart that we we put more work into our Instagram than any other show. But we have to. <laughs> There's a reason yeah. for that. <laughs> and you know what? I was wondering, like, what in your education up until that moment prepared you to do this? Um, well, I would say for me, really, like the research skills that we learned mm -hmm. at FIT in the master's program are key because, um, wow, I would say, and correct me if you think I'm wrong, Cass, I would say 90 to 95% of our research for the show is primary source. Um, unless, of course, we're um, interviewing somebody else about their particular book that technically would be a secondary source, but a lot of those people are, you know, fellow scholars working in our field. Um, so it, one of the things that we've always, it was always very important to, about the show was that there was like a scholarly, there were scholarly academic underpinnings, but we wanted it to be approachable and accessible to anybody. Mm -hmm. So for me, I would, I would say that like that, that kind of like scholarly structure of the show um, that really came from learning how to do the research and do it properly from grad school mm -hmm. right. and writing and, and working on the books that we worked on. Yeah. And I mean, the level of scholarship that we 
bring to each podcast, I think sets us apart too, because we are historians. And so we've used that education and that training to inform each and every podcast that we do. So that's really a central aspect to the podcast. Yeah. And, and I would say like, there's even been instances where I've wanted to tackle of a, tip, a particular topic, but maybe I wasn't able to find enough primary sources mm -hmm. or I wasn't able to find ones that I could like fully vet and felt comfortable with. We'll just skip the topic and move on to something else because we joke all the time that we could make this show forever because <laughs> there are so many things to talk yeah. about. We yeah. have a running list right now that's, I don't know, like hundreds of ideas. So, yeah. And so is there, I, one of the things that I, I really love about the podcast um, is that you really are able to make a lot of very complex topics accessible uh, without lowering the bar. I mean, it's still, like you said, it's, it, it feels very academic, it feels very well researched, but it's very approachable. It's very easy. Some uh, episodes are almost like, I feel like a checklist for someone who would want to get into or understand more and you really sort of like lay it out, you give sources. Um, how do you do it? How do you make it so accessible? That's just really kind of like, that's what we set out to do from, from the very, very beginning. Mm -hmm. And I've always said, like, you know, we set, we love what we do so much. We're so obsessed with it. We're so passionate about it. And we wanted to share that with people outside of our field. So mm -hmm. when we set out to make the show, we never set out to make it for our, our fellow fashion studies community. It was more for like a pop mass audience. So the tone was something that we kind of had to play with back and forth for a while. And I think um, the first season, it was a little difficult at certain times because we had both been writing for print for so much. And the way that you write for the show and the way that you write for print is 100% different. And it, and it took us a while, probably for like the first, maybe half of the first season before we really kind of got in the swing and more that got a lot easier. Mm -hmm. So what are some of your favorite episodes? Oh my goodness. Um, and it's crazy. We just recorded, I think our like 200th or something episode. Like we, it's, it's insane. I still remember in April and I started the podcast and now we're at 200 episodes, but um, that's a really hard question, but I, one of my hands down favorite episodes is with Tony Vaccato, who is an Italian American photographer who was a World War II combat soldier. Uh, he just beat COVID at 96 years old. And uh, he shot over 9,000 photographs in World War II. And when he left the war, he he went on this mission to find beauty in the world and he became a fashion photographer in the golden age of haute couture, the golden age, 1950s and 60s fashion. So he has all these incredible photographs. I actually just purchased my first like grown up art piece from him and it's this photograph of Hubert de Givenchy at a pool in France. <laughs> and he has all these wonderful- Cause they were hanging out, that's why. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> he was friends with Givenchy. He was friends. I mean, he's photographed everyone from Georgia uh, O'Keeffe to Pablo Picasso. Um, and just an incredible man with so much heart and such this prolific career. And mm -hmm. and he the fact that he happened to work in fashion at a certain point in his career gave us this um, ability to feature him on the show. And I was able to interview him. And that was really, really special. Um, I would say, I think sometimes because Cass and I so often are actually, um, she's in New Mexico and I'm in New York. I, I would also say that some of our really special episodes are when we do actually get to record together in the studio. Right. <laughs> yeah. um, and one of my favorite instances of that is when Stephen Burroughs came on the show. So it was the three of us and yeah. our tech in the studio. And he is just the most incredibly lovely human being you know how some people just have that like exude that special quality that you just know like okay this person is like 
special, special. Like there's just something about him and he was so gracious and lovely and funny. And, um, that was, that was just one of those episodes where I feel like the whole thing, the whole time, it was just like, it congealed. You can like, feel, yeah, you could feel it in the studio that it was just like, mm -hmm. it, it's a fantastic episode. And I think also he's been in fashion for so long and has like this from the bottom kind of experience he's done it all he's been around in that also that period where designers did everything it's not just like tech packs and sending it along and and you know producing somewhere else that like new york vibe uh, it really is a fantastic episode um and you know a lot of the conversations that i had so far with fashion scholars and and um fashion designers was about education and sort of like fashion education and, and I, mm -hmm. I do consider the podcast as as a facet of fashion education um mm -hmm. and i was wondering if if you feel like in the podcast you have an opportunity to sort of like fill gaps that were maybe things that were missing from your own fashion education. Do you want to do that one, Kat? Or I can... Oh, yeah. And I mean, I would say absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when I was... And Karen, you and I were in the same program. We overlapped. Um, and so I would say the focus on fashion history as being a Euro-American, um, white-centered right narrative um, is something that's starting to change a lot over the last 10 years that's been a conversation especially right now it's really really um, a, a change that I think we're seeing implemented more and more um, but that was part of my fashion education was that fashion history began in Europe in the Middle Ages it's a European phenomenon and everything else was world dress, right? So I had a year of fashion history and I had one semester of world dress, like this homogenous. <laughs> Everyone else. <laughs> Everyone else in the entire <laughs> world, every other culture, you know, in one. So that kind of, I think, speaks to what my fashion education was um, in my formal fashion education in my master's program. Moving out of that program, um, you know, there really has been a shift to change the definition of fashion itself, um, to extend the definition of fashion to um, fashion systems exist in cultures around the world. And I think that's something that we've tried to implement in the podcast really since day one is kind of shifting that narrative from that kind of white centered Eurocentric um, fashion narrative. Um, and certainly, like we just did a two part episode on the kimono, which was revelatory because it was the VNA, it's the VNA exhibition on the kimono that's really telling you that this is there's this whole fashion system that existed in Japan. Um, and that's just not something that you hear about. So I would say, yeah, the, um, it's been really special, especially with bringing in, in different guests and be, being able to highlight their scholarship and their years and years of work. Um, and being able to be a platform for that has is, is, is definitely been been what we've been trying to do with the podcast since the beginning. And I feel like, sorry, and, yeah, go ahead, April. Oh, no. Um, on, on the subject of education, I think that um, making the show has been an education in and of itself for the two of us, mm -hmm. because, you know, when we do have a guest on, we are reading, like, right. You know, all their book or their like all their journal articles or their work or whatever so um it's it's really you know deepened my own understanding and practice just by sheer immersion in other people's work um, you know and 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 sometimes with this little thing that somebody else is working on then you know that somebody else is kind of doing waiting in that same water um, and then you can connect the two of them um, so this has also been an exercise in trying to you know build our community as mm -hmm. well very much so and and what I wanted to say in relation to what Cassidy said about the kimono what I, I loved about that interview when she described how they have a loan uh, from someone and they come and, and the kimono is dressed on a mannequin and they they didn't recognize their own 
object right. because it, it, you know it looks so different and kimonos are not are rarely in museum or dressed on a mannequin which tells you sort of like how western museum interpret them not as a mm -hmm. fashion but this like art object absolutely um, mm -hmm. so that is that was really like a really interesting um you know something that i even never thought about um mm -hmm. when you know in in relation to that um and you know you said at the beginning about like all those different things that you do Cass, you you're a phd student before that you worked um in costume design and april you work at special collections and and you do all of the different things and i was wondering first of all how do you even do it and second what do you what's the intersection between those all of those things how do you bring all of those things together if you do um, I would say it was, it was um, juggling all of that was a difficult the first season. It was really difficult. So um, how it kind of parlays out is I end up working about six and a half days a week. Um, but the reason that that is possible is because I love what I do. And also um, being at Special Collections and, and just being around all of the objects and all of the sources, sometimes I'll get ideas in the course of going about my day working on some other project that like will weave themselves into the show or I'll somebody else you know I'll be reshelving something and I'll see a new book that I've never seen before and I'm like oh this would be perfect to talk about something else um you know so so from that way they kind of like go back and forth but it's a lot of scheduling and it's a lot of um you know just making sure we're meeting the deadlines there's usually a month calendar just for the podcast on my refrigerator and i write in my due dates and my deadlines um, but that's not to say that there hasn't been a time or two where Cass and i are recording an episode that maybe is going to launch the next day <laughs> <laughs> we try not to do that <laughs> yeah we we and we divide and conquer too which helps a lot um and uh yeah i mean i still am trying to figure out how to manage it honestly april's so much better at, at it than i am with her calendar um but uh yeah and i do like this summer obviously i'm off of school so i try to do as much work for the podcast as i possibly can when i have breaks uh and try to get ahead so that i can kind of keep school and and the uh podcast um separate i guess mm -hmm. and you know it seems like everything you touch turn into gold and i was wondering if you if <laughs> there's you. Any, oh. <laughs> <laughs> intellectual gold okay. um um i was wondering if there is like a failure you experience that you would maybe like to share Oh, that's a hard one. Um, you know, sometimes, sometimes there, sometimes, you, sometimes I'll get partway into writing an episode. I'm like, this isn't working. Like, you can't find that sweet spot. You can't find the connection into like that mass appeal or something about it just feels clunky. Um, this just happened to me a couple weeks ago, actually. And so I scrapped it. And I was like, I would rather not do this than not do it properly. Um, and then it was a mad scramble to figure out what I was going to do because we had to, we had to make something to fill that time slot. But, um, but that's okay because I would rather not, you know, do something halfway and, and have it come out as like a mediocre end product. That's just me. Yeah. I mean, I guess a big failure that turned, I try not to, when I have failures, I try to take them as learning experiences, right? So I learn from them and grow from them and move on. Um, but when I was younger I, and I was fresh out of my undergrad program and I thought I wanted to be a costume designer and, um, you know, it turns out all I really liked about costume design was just doing the fashion history research, but I thought I wanted to be a costume designer. And I just had a really, I had an internship at like the Santa Fe Opera here in New Mexico. And I could just, I, there's, I could not get a job. I could not get a job in costume design or costume out of, out of college. 
So that was kind of a wake up call for me. I ended up, you know, serving, serving. Um, I think I was still working at Old Navy, you know, um, and just trying to pivot and find out what I wanted to do next. And, you know, I, that's when the film industry started booming here and I got into the film industry. So it worked out perfectly, <laughs> actually. <laughs> And I, I would like to piggyback on that and say that, you know, all of this takes time. I had the same experience after grad school. Mm -hmm. So I graduated um, with my master's in 2009, which was the recession, right? So, so many institutions were on hiring freezes. I interviewed at so many different places. Nothing really panned out. Um, and, and that's when I started working on the book, um, the Fashion Plates book. So I just had like a kind of like an aha moment that like, no one's going to hand this to you. So maybe you should figure out your own path and create your own way. Um, and I think that um, as our field moves forward, we're going to see, have to see more and more of that because there are so many people graduating into our field. And because I've become very close a lot of times with our interns in special collections and, and the grad students that are there, um, doing research all the time. We end up becoming friends over all these years. You know, oftentimes people will come back to me that just graduated and they're like, I can't find anything. And I'm like, and they're like, it's been four months. And, and I think kind of the reality is, is that it, it's going to take some time to kind of like find that way. Right. And, and patience in that regard is, is, is um, beneficial. So um, what was it? Uh, Patricia Mears told me once that she adjuncted for like nine years before she started working at the museum at FIT. That gives you perspective. Yeah. And yeah. so did Valerie <laughs> Steele actually too. So yeah. she was teaching for a really, really long time as well before, um, you know, that kind of full-time gig kind mm -hmm. of came their way. So. You know, I always think of, you know, that Ira Glass um, little thing where he talks about that gap and how you need to put in the 10,000 hours. Mm -hmm. um, it's it, so I really, I preach by that because it, it is all about just doing the work and doing the work and doing the work and um, really just looking forward because, you know, you, you never know where opportunity will come from. And also too, I think that when you do do that, you kind of find out where your strengths are within, like within your practice. And then you can kind of like guide yourself a little bit more in that direction. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I know that fashion theory is not my strong place. So I don't, I don't <laughs> <laughs> try to wander into that territory where other people are so much better than I am. So, you know. And so that kind of leads me to accomplishments. Is there any, like, any particular accomplishment that you guys feel especially proud of? Um, I, I don't know, maybe being still, the show is still here three years later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's incredible. Yeah, and the book, too, I mean, yeah, the book, too, was a huge accomplishment. I mean, I think for us to have worked on that, for a year and we really didn't know each other that well which is really interesting we had met and you know really liked each other and really gotten along but for us to go our separate ways and produce this book together was was this incredible incredible um accomplishment and something i think we're both really really proud of and then the for the podcast to come out and kind of naturally evolve out of that um it's been it's been a really um interesting and a uh, ride and i do have to say the book itself is just as an object it's just like almost like a piece of art it's so beautiful um it really is oh man yeah pushwar is just incredible. It's it so is incredible there were a lot of um paper samples <laughs> and tests <laughs> that were run to try to get it as close to like the original objects so thank you chance and hudson for that <laughs> yeah <laughs> Well, um, Cassidy and April, thank you so much for, you know, coming on and sharing your experiences um, and all this incredible work that you've been doing. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for having us.
Thank you for having us, Karen. And thank you for being a guest on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs>